So thank you very much for the nice introduction and for the opportunity today to give this uh, keynote to you. Yeah, talking about artificial intelligence and threats in, in, in general. So I want to start a little bit common and then focus on, I think, three really mainly challenges we face today. First, the topic of cybersecurity. Second, the issue, how to preserve a free World Wide Web. And third, of course, as the title already says, how are we going to use artificial intelligence? What are the chances, but also what are the challenges from many point of views we uh, face already today? So 30 years ago, we have overcome a wall here in Germany, right here in our nation's capital, Berlin. And the fall of the wall was the prelude, I would say, for the end not only of a divided Germany, but also of a divided Europe back in these days. The reunified Germany has since then held a permanent place in the European Union, just like Western Germany did before in the second half of the last century. Germany has promoted European integration as a project for freedom, for security and prosperity since then. And we have done so, I would say, with great commitment, but also with honest conviction. After centuries in which the European countries have waged wars and experienced armed conflicts, we see the European Union now as a peace project as a guarantee that war will never again be waged in Europe. And um, we build a space within the European Union for democracy, for freedom of expression. And now, today, having the digital age, we face new threats and new challenges. So as I said before, I will focus on, on three of them, three digital driven areas, I would say, and I would also say three major challenges for our security, for our freedom, and for our prosperity. So first of all, the threats to cybersecurity. It used to be conventional warfare that was considered as the major threat. Today, I think more and more we see that hybrid wars, that cyberspace attacks are really those who threaten us. As cyber attacks increase, some are open, some are, some are more taking place in secret, we see these new challenges. And of course, NATO plays a key role for us addressing these cyber threats. And when the issue of cyber defense was prominently placed on the Alliance agenda back in 2002 at the NATO summit in Prague, there were still some voices at that time that believed that that was kind of wasting of resources, that NATO needed more to focus on the true threats. I think today nobody would say that anymore. Because by the spring of 2007, at the latest by the cyber attacks in Estonia and the grave consequences for the country, cyber threats, I think, are taken now seriously as conventionally military threats are. So today, in addition to land, air and sea, cyber is a separate area within the NATO structures. And at the NATO summit in Brussels in the summer of 2018, the Allies agreed to set up a new cyberspace operation center as part of NATO's strengthened command structure. And it was also agreed to use NATO's national cyber capabilities in its missions and operations. And because we attached a great importance to cybersecurity uh, in Germany, we were also one of the six founding members of the Cooperat Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn, which was established then in 2008. I had the chance to visit it last year, and I have to say I was really impressed of the excellent work that is done there, I think for yeah, a lot of 
our security. Um, and if you see, there's like one single hub where researchers, analysts, educators from the military, also governmental agencies come together and bring together their experience. And due to the high relevance of this topic, in 2016, we also decided in Germany to establish our own cybersecurity strategy, which describes the cyberspace at NATO's operating room. And as further uh, measure in April 2017, we set up the cyber, uh, the cyber and information space within our military, the Bundeswehr. And it's now that more than 14,000 soldiers, strong unit, are above all operations, the protection, the deployment and the further de development of the IT systems of the Bundeswehr, as well also as for provisions of geo information data, for example. So I think if we want to defend our security, our freedom and prosperity in Europe, we have really to probably even put more effort on this topic on cyber defense, because I think it's like one of the most really big issues and challenges we face these days. And because, of course, these developments go fast and it's a really dynamic, fi uh, dynamic field, I think we need even more international cooperation in terms also of setting common rules and behavior. That brings me to the second topic, topic how to preserve a free and open World Wide Web. I think, first of all, we need a function internet governments. The decentralized, also open and free architecture of the internet, I think it's a prerequisite um, for democracy, for fair competition, and also for innovation. Unfortunately, the open architecture of this network has been under a lot of increasing pressure and pressure in the last years. Some countries looking at Russia, looking at China, but also in other places, there are a lot of tendencies to fragment this internet, to create national intranets, and also to create closed regional systems. So from a German, or I would even say from a European uh, point of view, we really think that a multi-stakeholder approach here is how the dialogue should take place. So having and bringing together, of course, the states or governments, but also international organizations, business uh, representatives, science, the technical community, and also, of course, civil society. And I think that is really a complex subject we talk about because the decentralized architecture with various networks, of course, involves many different actors, as I just said, but all these actors should sit together. And uh, of course, this, I think, takes place. Um, if you think about the, um, the, the, uh, the EGF um, uh, that also takes place this year. And I think that we need to strengthen this approach even more. And um, if you see, like some actors these days, exercise more state control over the internet. You also see that these actors on the other side, they try to push away um, the deciding or debating structures from the EGF to the ITU, so that there are no more civil interests represented, that there are no more um, other parts taking place. And uh, in finally, that the multi-stakeholder approach, which we really are in favor in Germany, is not represented anymore as it was before. And it's also no secret, I tell you, I think that the internet is censored in many, many countries. Just last week, Russia issued an internationally claimed law that aims to establish a national internet under complete state control. 
And we see these ten tendencies also, of course, not only within these separate states, but also around their regional environment. And of course, in many, especially in authoritarian states, the free internet is a thorn in the side of political leaders because the net provides all these possibilities to have free discussions, to have free political activity, to have, yeah, finally democratic opposition. And it is therefore very close to, I think, to why some states want um, to be uh, these decisions to be shifted more towards a state-dominated bodies, such as the ITU. But this would finally pave the way for individual governments and also, um, yeah, I think strengthen these, um, these ways of a more closed, of a more, um, in the end, not any more free uh, network finally. And I think we must prevent that. The German, German government is committed at national level, but also at the European and the international level to ensure an uncensored and free access to web. So Germany advocates freedom and openness and non-discrimination, access to a fast and to a secure internet, also access to digital con content and equal transport of all data in the web in all bodies of the global internet and the free internet regulation. Important for us is the protection of human rights, the protection also of the confidentiality of digital communications and personal data, but also the, pride, uh, the right to privacy. And we want to find international solutions against cyber attacks, against hate speech, against deep fakes, but also against attempts to um, yeah, manipulate, in the end, um, elections and also um, to influence elections. I think this is really a topic coming up more and more. So at the Internet Governments Forum, the EGF, I mentioned it already, that takes place this year in uh, Germany. Uh, we really um, are glad in November. I think we will continue um, to work for these goals. The German government also aims um, to support local internet government structures as parts of also a digital um, development cooperation finally. So with business and science, we want to discuss with our international partners, for example, about private-public partnership models and how to improve connection also of develop developing countries to the global internet infrastructure. So in order for developing countries also to become even more involved in the internet governments, the federal government also has decided to uh, give more funds now for the EGF in 2019, that there are no hurdles for any country to yeah, attend and to be involved in the IGF this year. So and I'm really convinced that we really need to succeed finally in preserving the free internet because I think this is really crucial for a free um, democracy and a free also um, freedom also maintaining um, worldwide. Third topic, AI as a chance, but also of course as a challenge. I think if we look at China, if we look in the US, the approach of how to use AI is really different regarding our perspective from a German, from a European point of view. Also, if you think about the starting conditions, especially with regard to regulation on the protection, for example, for personal data, we have a really different situation comparing China, but also comparing the United States. So for machine learning, which is so it's one of the driving tools, if you talk about AI, you rely on having a really huge amount of data. In China, more or less all data is practically owned by the state. And AI, I think, has a dual a function for the system in China. First of all, of course, 
it aims to increase prosperity, but it also aims to uh, increase political power over the citizens. Especially, for example, when you look at the social scoring system of the Chinese, where more or less everyone gets completely supervised, I think by no means this is a system we could ever accept uh, in Germany or in the European Union. There's a close cooperation between the digital companies and the states in a sense that the data that comes to the companies has to be made available for the state, but on the other side, the state also supports the companies um, in terms of economic policy. And data protection, you can't imagine like how many huge discussions, sometimes maybe a little bit too huge on the other side we have in Germany about this topic. But data protection on the other side in these countries plays no role at all. So also having these links between, I would say, um, not transparent links between the, um, the big companies and on the other side, the states. Also, this is a fact I think we really do not see in Europe for a free market economy. But there are also things we can learn from China. I also want to mention that. If you see like with how much pace, with how much also detonimation, the approach of AI is going forward, how much money also is spent. Just giving a sum to you, the city of Tichan invests about 12 billion euro, just the city. The German AI strategy has 3 billion euro. So if you compare, of course, other dimensions, more people. Um, but if you compare these numbers, I think it really um, says and uh, yeah, really uh, underlines how much pressure China is putting on this topic. In the US, we have a different situation. Big tech companies come together um, with yeah, building in the end now platform economies. And I think many, many criteria and some really important key criteria um, are good in the US. So first of all, as I said, before also um, the availability of a huge amount of data. You need it, it's crucial to develop AI. Second, of course, technological know-how. Um, and then, of course, also a lot of capital that is invested. So I think it's no coincidence, <laughs> finally, that um, the leading AI ecosystem still um, is the Silicon Valley. Um, although China is really pushing hard um, forward, but still I would say the Silicon Valley is the leading AI system ecosystem in the world. They can pay really high salaries. It's uh, even, yeah, I would say one maybe of the biggest uh, challenges we face as well, um, because you don't only need data, you need the smart people. And uh, if you compare like what salaries they're paid in the Silicon Valley compared to a German university, there is a big gap, I would say. And also it's not about only the salary, but also um, that researchers in the United States don't have like so many hurdles to um, work in a, at a university, but also work for the private sector at the same time in Germany. And I think in many countries in Europe, this is really um, not that easy. So I think what we're really good about in Germany is, of course, the, the basic research about AI. But what we really have to make better is um, to get an exchange between the research um, um, persons on the one side and the economy on the other side. Um, we have the DFKI, the uh, Deutsche Zentrum für Künstliche Intelligenz, it's a German um, institute, but it's um, still the largest institute worldwide um, talking about AI. So we see the basic research is good in Germany, but we have to do better bringing this research um, um, things also into products. And um, I think um, seeing these facts, we can do better. 
And we have really to see what can we learn from China on the one side, from the US on the other side. But in the end, we have to go our own way. We have to make an own way saying AI made in Europe. Um, we must also, of course, focus on ethical issues. So um, the high level expert group on artificial intelligence of the European Commission has presented um, ethical guidelines just this year in April. And I think that this is really a good um, base uh, in the question how to use AI and also um, talking about maybe fields um, where uh, we see the use of AI uh, more critical. So brings me to the point, of course, we also have to put more effort on that. I mentioned um, the three billion but it's not only about the money, it's also about connecting the different strategies. France has an AI strategy. I think almost every country in Europe has now an own AI strategy. We have to bring these strategies even, I think, more together. And um, I think it's really necessary if we don't finally want to sit in the back yeah, uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a car or just making the, the picture of a car. We want to sit in the driver's seat and not in the back, because um, also if we want to have an impact on how technologies, how market rules will uh, develop in the future, um, and if we want to set, uh, set also standards, we have to, um, have to sit in the driver's seat and therefore we have to put more effort on this topic. Um, therefore, of course, again, we need, I think, closer cooperation. And um, this is not only if we talk, for example, about research um, of AI. I think it's also if you talk about um, the expansion of, of course, technical infrastructure we need. Um, we need adequate uh, computing capacities and hardware, above all semiconductor um, technologies. And we also need cooperation in high performance computing um, and finally, also we need uh, infrastructure, a trustworthy European data infrastructure. Um, you might have heard these days about Gaia-X, um, um, now a data infrastructure that was presented from the German government also at the Digital Summit uh, last week. And I think we are going the right steps there, but really um, have to continue this, uh, this way. Um, expanding also um, these, I would say, really crucial topics, uh, not only in Europe, but also on a wider um, a scene, also, of course, on a wider international level. Um, I think it's really important that we expand the global network, also with uh, emerging and developing countries. And uh, I think that um, finally we have to do our homework, of course, from a German point of view, but we, I think, can only um, bring together and, uh, and um, face these challenges and find solutions if we do more international cooperation. And um, for that, it's really good to um, come together to uh, have different uh, discussions and summits. And so really thankful again to be here, um, to have the also opportunity to um, uh, discuss with you, but also to set um, the topic of AI, because I think it is one of the probably most important technologies uh, within the next five or 10 years. And uh, you can't really start early enough to, to uh, have this discussion. So thank you really much for having me here and for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. It's good to have a young person to explain these, these things to you. We have time for one or maybe two questions, if they're quick. Yes. Do we have a microphone for, for, for yes, for you and then you, you, OK? okay. Good. Sorry about that. Good. Um, a scrupulous uh, description of those uh, horrors who are in front of us. Uh, uh, 
My question will be uh, very short. Um, my name is Emmanuel uh, Zingeris. I'm from. Um, I'm chairing the subcommittee on transatlantic relations and democracy development in Lithuanian Parliament. I'm at the same time vice vice chair of a committee on human rights in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. So, in my committee in the front uh, next week, uh, we will have uh, uh, main report hacked democracy mm -hmm. proposed by me. Uh, I would like to invite you to our podium uh, to have internal in Strasbourg internal um, discussion before the report will be printed by Political Affairs and Human Rights Committee. Com a question will be following to you: How it's possible uh, uh, to upper to upper? Mm, the uh, a level of dangerous what you just saying about totalitarian regimes trying to interrupt to our elections in Paris, London, uh, um, Washington, and how it's uh, how it's possible uh, to have among priorities in, in the Commission, European Union Commission, uh, under chairmanship of Madame von der Leyen in the future. And how it's possible to rank the priority to number one priority, not letting uh, totalitarian regimes like China and Russia to interrupt our democratic life here, especially during the elections. And second question about military. How to ban uh, the high-tech uh, building military armies and uh, including the future danger that those uh, uh, military robots will be used by uh, uh, the countries who will not have democratic control uh, against the uh, robotronic armies. Thank you. So we need to have a rather quick answer and then a rather very quick question after that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So first question, I think, um, as I said, we need more European cooperation at that point and we need also more cooperation uh, within NATO and we need to know that this question costs money. Although you don't see it, it's not like that visual, like I said before, like former wars were. Hybrid wars, they're not that visual, but they are there. And we have to really, I think, spend also, we have a big discussion about that in Germany, about the two percentage um, a goal of NATO, uh, if we want to do that or not, if it's too much money or not. Uh, my party is really saying uh, we have to spend money because security costs, finally. So I think, um, although these are not the really like nice political discussions you have every day, um, there are really more topics that are they make might make more more fun. I don't know. Um, you, we have to to face these, and we have to have the um, uh, finally also the the cooperation and the money, because I think, of course, each country can spend a lot of money, but we have to get a more more common perspective, I think, finally. So second question uh, about uh, uh, um, autonomous weapons, uh, if I understood it right. Um, also, I think, of course, I would say from a democratic, also from an ethical point of view, I don't want um, a robot uh, going to, to war. It, for me, it's, it's, I would say it's a, it's a really a sensitive topic, but we have to know that others will build these robots. And for our security, again, we have to spend money to know how these technologies work, to know how can we defend ourselves if um, uh, these weapons uh, might come uh, uh, against us. So although you can have the opinion or not to use these weapons uh, from your own perspective, you have to be able to defend yourself. And therefore, it's again about, I think, spending money and having more cooperation. No. Hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your speech. I have two quick questions. Uh, Take it one, please. Take it one. Okay, all right. Uh, one question. Uh, actually, I'm writing the thesis on the same topic, artificial intelligence. So my question is, I have been living in Berlin since a year. I don't know about the other cities, but um, I would like to know the reforms that are being taken on the digitalization in uh, Germany overall or Europe. Because uh, uh, I have seen that uh, there are still many shops that don't accept the plastic money. And uh, I also see very less use of the mobile banking or the online transactions that are uh, being taken place in, in the Berlin. So I would just like to ask, are there any reforms that uh, the government is planning to take on the improvement of the uh, digitalization, particularly? The, the, the German government? Yes. Yeah, yes. Um, 
Well, there are, I don't know, like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of reforms. Um, first of all, of course, it's about infrastructure so that everyone, and of course, we always compare us, I don't know, with Singapore or with Estonia. That's a little bit tough because um, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of people in, in Germany and uh, it's really challenging to get like, uh, um, um, to get like the fast uh, internet to every single household, to every single um, a company, but we have to do that. Um, second, of course, we have to, I think, to do more for startups because startups are really huge drivers um, for di uh, digitalization. And um, we have a lot of bureaucracy. I think, or in my opinion, it's not all, always about asking of course what can we do how can we support startups but it's also about how can we create a climate of innovation how can we not make it so difficult for young people to say i want to be a founder i want to have my own startup uh, i want to do that and uh, therefore I, I also think we need a more um yeah friendly economic climate finally that young people um, take responsibility that young people say i want to do this and uh, i want to be successful and uh, therefore, I would say the second uh, topic besides infrastructure is also how to support and how to create a good climate for startups. And Thank you. If, in Berlin, if you have some time, uh, still left, uh, it's really one of the huge uh, centers uh, in Germany uh, where we have a lot of, lot of startups here, also a lot of AI startups um, here uh, in Berlin. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.